Good morning. Happy Easter. Hey, wasn't that an incredible video? It was awesome. That was Jeremiah and his wife. Um, he, does, he does amazing work. Hey, my name is Dan. If we have not had the chance to meet yet, I would love to connect with you right after the service. I'm the campus pastor here at Grace. And if it is your first time, second time, if you've been kind of dabbling and checking us out, I definitely want to say welcome to you. We are so happy that you decided to celebrate Easter with us today. And hey, if you're watching this online, whether it's live or you're on Facebook, we want to say special welcome to you as well. If you are watching this later, we would encourage you on Facebook to, to, to share a comment. Let us know uh, what you think about the message and also share this video. Uh, I believe that God has something uh, to say to somebody, one of your friends, family members. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, hey, we're continuing this series on being beautifully broken. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you've heard us kind of talk about this. You've heard us share a few different stories, and we're going to continue in that today. Before you do that, or before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and invite our ushers to go ahead and come on down. We've got Bibles for you. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we are going to have the verses up here on the screen. But if you do want to follow along, go ahead and raise your hand. Our ushers will get you a Bible. So today we are going to be looking at the story of Hosea. We've been talking about it. Again, if you were here with us last Sunday, you heard this story. If you uh, were here with us on Good Friday, you heard a little bit of it as well. But we're continuing in the book of Hosea. But before we do that, as the ushers are finishing passing out the Bibles, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. God, we love you so much, and we're just so thankful, Lord, for what you have done for us what you did on the cross for us, God, the reason why we are here today, the reason why we are celebrating today is because of what you did. And I pray that we will not forget that. I pray that you would speak through me this morning, God, that it would not be my words, Father, but it would be yours. That you would allow us to hear what it is that you want us to hear through this message today. In your name I pray, amen. So if you've been coming for a little while, you know that I like to tell jokes you know that I like to have a good time. This is church. Can we have a good time in church? Is that something that we can do? We've got a few people over here. We can have fun in church. That's okay to do. Okay, Easter is a great holiday. I love it. My kids love it. I used to dye Easter eggs. But back in 1989, okay, I was about seven years old. I'm, I'm 36. Those of you who are going to start doing the math in your head. 36, right? I was seven years old. Uh, and it was Easter of 1989. And, and I realized that this was the point in time where my fear of water kind of started. Okay. I had this fear of water when I was a kid and, and I didn't really know why. I didn't really understand why until I started thinking about it a little bit more. And I realized it all started when I was seven or eight years old. You see, my grandparents, they used to live out by the Colorado river. And what comes along with that is they had boats and we spent every three-day weekend there and every holiday. And, and it was a good time. I had a good time growing up. But I also had a little traumatization that took place when I was a kid. When I was seven years old, we were out there. My dad owned a boat and we're on the river and his boat broke down. Now I'm seven and I'm convinced that there are monsters in the river. Okay, there is something deep down in that eight foot water that just wants to get me, right? If it's not a shark, it's a sea monster. There's something in that abyss that wants to get me. And I'm freaking out. My dad's boat is broken down. We're floating down the river and I'm freaking out. I'm like, dad, we gotta get going. Whatever it is, the Kraken is gonna come and get us. And he's like, son, do you trust me? There's nothing in the water. Do you trust me? I was like, yeah, dad. He grabs me, throws me in the water. <laughs> grabs me, pulls me out. And I'm <laughs> I'm just crying. I'm just hysterical. He's like, see, there's nothing in the water. Now, a couple weeks ago when I, when I was teaching, I talked about how I made a questionable decision in, in raising of my son, and I think I know where I got it. My dad might have made some questionable <laughs> decisions raising me. But uh, beyond that, I ended up being okay. Well, well a, a couple months later into the summer, my grandpa, I didn't want to get back in, in a boat. My grandpa's like, you know what? Let's get in the boat. Let's go fishing. And I was like, I don't want to do that. He's like, come on, I got a little boat. It'll be fun. We get in his little boat and we go, we, we go out in the river. We're out there for five minutes. And all of a sudden I start hearing something in the boat. And I'm like, well, what is that? Right? Well, what had happened was a mouse had built a little den inside the boat and had had babies. So we're on this boat and all these little mice are running around. So I got like these little creatures from hell chasing me in this boat. <laughs> And it's like my options are deal with these like fuzzy demons or like jump into the abyss of the river. 
A few weeks after that, actually a couple months after that, same, same summer, uh, I'm playing in the river. I jump in and I bust my knee open. I have to get 10 stitches in my knee. And I realized that there's a reason why I have a fear of water as I grew up. But I've overcome that fear. You know, I know we're doing baptisms today. I've checked. There's no monsters. There's no sharks. But I've overcome that fear. And I know that's a, that's a funny story, but there was a part of me that was really broken for a, a long time. There was a part of me that realized I, I shouldn't be afraid of water. There's nothing to be afraid of, but I had this fear. And I was broken. There was a part of me that was broken because most kids my age weren't afraid of the water. They were excited to get in the water, but not me. And I know that it's funny, but we've been asking these, sto- these questions the last few weeks about uh, what if the most broken things about you, what if the darkest things about you were actually what made you beautiful? Now, I know it's funny, haha, Dan, Dan was afraid of water and little mice and whatnot, but the reality is beyond that, I've, I faced childhood trauma and there's been a lot of difficult things that I've had to overcome in my life. And those things that I've dealt with, I, I've felt unworthy, I've felt broken. And I think each and every one of us have been there, whether it was Financial difficulty, a bankruptcy, a divorce, a loss, a broken relationship, insecurities. There's all kinds of areas that we are broken. But what makes us beautiful when we're broken is it makes us realize how much we need a loving God. It is because of those seasons in our life that we realize we need him. About 750 years before Jesus walked on this earth. There's this love story that we see in the book of Hosea. And if we were writing a love story, I know if I was writing a love story, it would, it would go something like this. It would go something like, oh, this, this, this nice young man, he meets, he meets this nice young girl in college and they both stayed pure their whole lives. They both have just great backgrounds and they, they just have their heads on straight and they meet each other. They get engaged, they get married, they buy a house, they have a few kids and they live happily ever after, right? But this is the real world. This is, not, this is not the picture perfect thing that we'd like it to be. And the Bible reflects the real world and our real struggles. And this story is about Hosea. Now, who is Hosea? If you don't know Hosea, uh, he was a godly man. He was a prophet. He lived in the northern region of Israel. And his job as a prophet was to tell the nation what God was saying. So like no big deal right? No pressure. Hey, hey, just uh, be our conduit to God, the creator of the universe, like no pressure, right? Well, God tells him, hey, I want you to go and I want you to get married. I don't want you to marry this, this young woman. And this young woman's name is Gomer. It's a bummer of a name, right? There's nobody in here named Gomer, is there? Should check first. <laughs> Someone raise their hand. If your name's Gomer, oh man. Okay. <laughs> I apologize now. Um, But her name is Gomer, and we don't know a ton about Gomer, but we know that she's a prostitute. That's what we know about Gomer. This is what it says, Hosea 1, 2, and 3. It says, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, go, marry a promiscuous woman, which is a prostitute. Go and marry a a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer. And what he's saying here is, uh, it says, uh, uh, have children with her for, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness. Israel continued to kind of do their own thing. And that's what this whole marriage had represented was God's love for Israel. Now I can only imagine Hosea's mind set at this point. God says, hey, go, go and marry a prostitute. Wait, wait, wait God, wait, come again? Do you know who I am? I feel like we've got a good connection here. Do you know who I am? I'm one of the most well-known people in the region. God, I have worked extremely hard to be well-respected in my community. I've worked extremely hard to build a life of integrity and a life of character. And you are asking me to do what? Marry a prostitute? God, you have got to be wrong about this. You've got to be wrong. God, you're right about a lot of things, but when it comes to my love life, I'm going to go ahead and stick to e-harmony because there is no way that you want me. There's no way you want me to marry a prostitute. And I think it's so interesting because I can relate. I can relate to this, this whole situation because it's like when things are going well in our lives, 
we're like, praise Jesus. When God is doing the things that we want him to do or the things that we think are right, everything's good. We come to church. We have a smile on our face. We have a lot more patience with our kids. Life is good. But then as soon as God starts to do things his way and not our way, we start asking him these questions. So let's, let's take a look at this through the eyes of Gomer for a little bit. Now, we know that she's a prostitute, and I can't imagine what kind of life drives you to a place of being in the sex industry, of being a prostitute. It could have been one of two things. Either she could have been a victim of the circumstances around her. Maybe she was an orphan. Maybe she was abused. Maybe she was neglected and homeless and needed to do whatever she needed to do for money. Maybe she was a victim of society. Or maybe it was just a string of bad choices. Maybe it was just a small compromise here and here and here, and one day she wakes up and she's a prostitute. We don't really know, but we can guess at, at, that nobody really wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I think I'm going to be a sex slave today. It's not something that is common. She probably was dealing with a lot of mistrust, a lot of insecurities. She was probably numb. No idea what physical intimacy was really like. No idea what, what emotional intimacy was like. I have no idea. She probably didn't deserve or didn't feel like she deserved a second chance at life. But we serve a God of second chances, amen? Can you guys hear me okay? Are we getting a lot of buzzing? Am I buzzing a lot? You want me to use that mic or are we good? Okay, I'm just going to keep going until you guys tell me to grab that mic. Cool. So, we serve a God of second chances. And God, through Hosea, gave Gomer a second chance. So, Gomer, or so, so Hosea goes and he marries Gomer. She gets rescued. She gets pulled from this lifestyle. Okay? She knew. She had to have known who Hosea was. She probably didn't feel like she deserved the love of any man, let alone a famous man who spoke directly with God. We see that they end up having three kids. They have a little boy, then a little girl, and then another little boy. And she's a wife. She's a mother. She's in a respected place. She is the, she is the spouse of somebody who's well-respected in the community. And I can imagine the expectations that she might have felt, the expectations that she placed on herself. There was probably doubt and shame that she carried with her, some of those things that she had done in her past. She must have felt so unworthy to be in the position that she was in. And I think she probably had a hard time accepting her new reality, accepting her new identity. You see, she started to let the lies creep in. She started to listen to that voice that was saying, you're unworthy. You're not good enough to have this lifestyle. You're not good enough to be a mother. You're, you're awful. But then here's another thing that she starts to listen to. She starts to listen to the truths. Now, hear me out when I say this. This is, this is a rich concept that I really want you to understand. In the New Testament, we see Jesus. He goes and he fasts for 40 days. And the devil tempts him while he is fasting. And the devil doesn't tempt him with a bunch of lies. The devil tempts him with the truth. The devil comes to him with, with uh, scripture, comes to him with the word of God. And so he's tempting him with the truth. And so we can find ourselves in that place, the same place that Gomer was in. She's sitting there thinking, well, I was a prostitute. Yeah, that's true. I made some bad decisions. She did. I'm not worthy. That's a lie. See, she's buying in to the old truth. She's not believing and grabbing a hold of the new truth that God has for her. Yes, she made some bad decisions. Yes, she was a prostitute. But she is not undeserving of the new identity that God has given her. She is not undeserving or unworthy of the forgiveness that she received through him. But she probably thought, I'm not good enough. This is not the life for me. And I can relate to this. I can relate to this in my own life. There are plenty of times that I believe the old truth about myself and not the new truth. And there are times that I believe the lies that the enemy wants to tell me 
about who I am and who I was and who God has for me to be. What are you believing about yourself this morning? What lie are you holding on to or what truth are you living in that is no longer the truth about who you are? It's the truth about who you say you are, but it's not the truth about who Jesus says you are. Do you believe this morning that you are worthy of being rescued, worthy of being forgiven? You see, time goes on. Time goes on in this story, and we see that, that Hosea wakes up one morning, and Gomer's gone. She's nowhere to be found. He's looking all over the house, and she's gone, and he's probably thinking to himself, well, how is the nation of Israel going to listen to me? I can't even hold my marriage together. I can't hide this. I'm a prominent name. I'm a staple here. People are going to know. Now I'm a single dad of three. I know how to be a prophet. I don't, I don't know how to be a dad. And Gomer, like us, she probably felt the shame. She got that fight or flight mentality and she ran. She was telling herself that the things that she had done were who she is. That's called shame. And I can relate to this. We often feel alone. We feel desperate. We feel hurt. And we end up going back to the things that are familiar to us. Maybe not even necessarily comfortable, but familiar. And so we see Gomer, she runs back to being a prostitute. There's no way that that was comfortable, but there was familiarity in what she knew. And so she ran back to it. But God wasn't done with her. God was not done with her. Just like he's not done with you, just like he's not done with me. I can only imagine what Gomer must have felt like. My wife and kids, they were just gone for, for a week visiting uh, my in-laws. And I missed my kids. I have three. And I missed them. I mean, they're, they're insane. But I missed them. <laughs> I found myself looking at pictures of them. I just missed my kids for a week. I missed my family being around. And I can only imagine what Gomer is going through. She left this life that she was living. A husband and three kids and wealth and probably prosperity. And she left and now she's back in the sex slave industry. She's probably thinking all hope is lost. I didn't deserve to be saved before. There's no way I'm going to be saved again. This is the life that God must have for me. This is the life that I'm choosing. I'm choosing to be a prostitute. This is my future. And when we get to this part of the story, most scholars believe that she was taken to what was essentially a human auction. She's a slave. So she's probably chained up. She's probably naked, ashamed, cold, embarrassed, dirty, emotionally numb, physically numb. And she's on the auction block, ready to be sold. In these types of settings, people were literally bidding on bodies. They were bidding to own this woman. And as she's, as she's standing there, I can't imagine the feelings that she had. Emptiness and of shame, brokenness, just accepting the tragedy that the rest of her life is going to be. She looks up and in the back of the room, she sees Hosea. Imagine the sinking feeling that she got. Have you ever been caught doing something that you shouldn't be doing, big or small, and that sinking feeling that you get? I can only imagine the embarrassment, the shame that she felt. You see, God had gone to Hosea after Gomer had left, and he said, go. Go and find her. Go get your wife back. What was he going to do? They make eye contact. What in the world is he going to do that he sees her back in the same place that she was? You see, throughout the entire story, we see God showing his love to the Israelites. And we see God showing unlovable, or we see God showing love to the unlovable through Hosea. 
She didn't deserve to be forgiven. She didn't deserve to be pursued. She didn't deserve the, the second chance that she got originally. There's no way that she deserves a third chance. Who's Gomer? I feel like I feel like I know some gomers. I feel like I know some people in my life, whether close or whether far away, that don't deserve forgiveness, that don't deserve to be rescued, don't deserve to be pursued. I know somebody like that. I know a few people like that. I'm sure we can all think of somebody. They might be in our homes, in our workplace. But the reality is, is when I start to look at this introspectively, I realize I'm gomer. Realize that each and every one of us, Mike, you're Gomer. Adam, you're Gomer. We are all Gomer. We are all in a place where we need to be rescued, where we need to be pursued, where we need to be forgiven. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't deserve to have the broken pieces of our lives put back together by the Savior, but we need it. Fast forward here about 750 years. And what we see is we see Jesus, he comes on the scene and he spends his time in the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament. He spends his time with people, getting to know them and living with them and teaching them. And he's not hanging out with the politicians. He's not hanging out with the rich. He's hanging out with the poor. He's hanging out with the depressed. He's hanging out with the drunks, the prostitutes, the thieves. The Gomers. That's who Jesus is spending his time with. And in Matthew 9, we see him. He encounters a guy named Matthew and goes to Matthew's house. He asks Matthew, hey, come and follow me. Give up the life that you are living. And Matthew's a tax collector. And if you're a tax collector in that day, you were basically a gangster. Okay? This was not a good position to be in. You were, you were hated. And Jesus goes with Matthew to Matthew's house. And he's hanging out with Matthew and all of his tax collector friends and prostitutes and drunks. And the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they don't like it. They don't like it at all. This is what they say. They say, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? This is Jesus' response in Matthew 9, verse 12. This is what he says. He says, "It uh, says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go And learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. Now here's the most important thing about that verse. Jesus is quoting the book of Hosea. He is looking back to this story and quoting the book of Hosea. Jesus is telling us right here that he's not here for those who are well. He is here for those who are sick. And each and every one of us need to be rescued. The religious leaders, they don't like this at all, not even a little bit, so they come up with this plot to kill Jesus. They work with one of his very own, Judas, and he's captured, and he's tried, and he's sentenced to death. We see him through the scriptures beaten. We see him spit on. We see him completely treated like dirt, tortured, bloody, bruised, humiliated, naked, nailed to a cross. And there he died on that cross. Now, if we look back at Gomer, she's naked. She's ashamed. She's chained. She's accepted her fate. She locks eyes with Hosea in the back of the room knowing that she is undeserving to be rescued. And I can only imagine the conversation that took place. She was a slave, which means she was owned by somebody else, and she was up for auction, so she was for sale. Hosea must have said, how much? How much for my wife? How much is it going to cost? The Bible tells us that he paid the cost for his wife. And just like Hosea pursued Gomer, gave her this third chance, 
Just like Hosea went to the deepest, darkest places in Israel where no man should go, where no man of God should go to the red light district looking in the deepest, darkest, nastiest places of the region for his wife. In that same way, God is going into the deepest and darkest regions of our hearts to rescue us, to meet us right where we are, broken, bruised, and enslaved. Hosea paid a price for his wife, a pretty hefty price, in fact. But God paid the ultimate price for you and for me. Most famous Bible verse that we've all heard before, John three sixteen. it says that he so loved the world, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Hosea paid a hefty price for his wife, but Jesus paid it all for you and for me. You see, the name Hosea means salvation. And the name Gomer means completed. Jesus is our Hosea. Through him, we are saved and we are Gomer. Through him dying on the cross, our lives, our broken lives, are restored and made complete again. In Mark chapter 16, after we see this after Jesus is nailed to the cross, they put him in a tomb. That happened on a Friday where he was hung on a cross. They put him in a tomb, and on Sunday, just like today, we see two of his, two of his followers go to the tomb. This is what it says. It says, uh, they entered the tomb. They saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not there. Jesus has risen. See, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we find freedom when we don't deserve it. We find forgiveness. The broken pieces of our lives are put back together again. We are restored, we are rescued. We're undeserving of it, but God loves us enough that if we call on his name, he does not give us what we deserve. He gives us love and grace and forgiveness. Jesus defeated death. He defeated death on the cross that day. And today, we celebrate that empty tomb. That's why we celebrate Easter. We celebrate that he has risen. Amen? Now, if you'll do me a favor, I'd like for each and every one of you, for for concentration and for privacy, I'd like for everybody in here to just go ahead and close your eyes. I'm going to go ahead and invite the band to come on up. But go ahead. I don't want anybody looking around. I want everybody's eyes closed in this moment. I just want you to think to yourself for a minute. What areas of your life are you Gomer? What areas of your life whether big or small, what areas of your life do you need God to come and find you and to meet you? If this is, if this is uh, one of those times a year where you just visit church and, and you haven't made that decision to follow Jesus, to, to make him the Lord of your life, in just a second, I'm gonna pray. And if that is you, I want you to say a quick prayer with me. I believe God wants to meet you in the deepest, darkest regions of your heart. Just like Hosea chased Gomer, God is chasing you this morning. Father God, we love you so much. We're so thankful that you sent sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. We are so undeserving of that love. We're so undeserving of that grace and that forgiveness. But God, you have met us right where we are at. And if you're in here this morning and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, I ask that you would just say this prayer after me. You could say it in the quiet and the stillness of your own heart. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I've made some bad decisions and I need you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I ask that you would come into my life and be the Lord of my life from this day moving forward. Father God, if we 
would do our best to just remember what it is that you did on the cross for us, we know that it would, it would significantly impact the way that we live our lives, God. So today as we leave this place, may we remember what you did on the cross on a Friday. You died for our sins. And three days later, you conquered death. You conquered the darkest parts of our lives. And you rose. And we're so thankful for that. God, we love you. We thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.